JFL Live. We back in the house. Boom! Tony G, Duval's Finest. You know who I am every day of the week. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. No holes bar. You know we, you know how we do it. We just talk about everything. So before we get started, what up, Johnny Jaguar? How y'all doing? Good to have you be here. Good to be here, baby. And we can't forget the guy on the right. Is that Fable? Who is that? Is that Fable? What's up, baby? It's your boy, Big Nian, baby. Welcome to JFL Live. You know who we are, baby. I got my dog, DJ, in the building. Switch me. And we're going to talk about that football. We're going to talk about that life. But first of all, we got to say, yo, Tony, what's going on, baby? I need what's going on with Tony. Yo, we're going to talk about this Tony talk. So, hey, I got a new thing. I'm going to do John since everybody got these days. Every time I turn around, there's a day and there's a week. So, for all y'all that's watching, this week is Petty Week. All right? Starting <laughs> Sunday, anybody did anything to you, go ahead and get petty. You got a whole week, just be petty. It don't even matter no more. We, the, the president <laughs> being petty, everybody being petty, so we're going to be petty. Now, let's talk about something serious. We are still giving away 20 turkey dinners. John, how many are we giving away? 20. We need y'all to go online. You need to hit our email and tell us about any family that's deserving of turkey dinners. We're going to give it all away. That's what we do. And you think that's something? Wait till we start talking about Christmas. Everybody get on board. Let's take care of the families. Um, I want to give a special thanks to uh, KO Electric. Uh, there's a couple of other companies that have came out and said, hey, we want to support this turkey drive, and we appreciate it. So listen, we are going to give these turkeys away. We need you guys to really send your emails in and tell us, give us a family that uh, really needs to have this. We want everybody to have a great Thanksgiving. It's very important. Jacksonville is a big city, and we should be able to take care of our own. And I say that all the time. So now that we've done that, Let's get to it, John. What's up? TJ, what's, what's happening? TJ, I'm chilling. What's, what's, let me go. Let me go. What's been going on, bro, man? I, we appreciate you being here, man. Thank you for coming on the show, bro. And I'm going to get it started because I'm going to be like, life after football for TJ Slaughter. How is it been for you, man? Well, when I first got done playing, um, I didn't know I was done playing, you know? And we went like... Uh, for about two years, I was working out three times a day, trying to get back in the league. Because, you know, nobody never tells you that uh, you're injury prone and all this stuff. But then when one doctor finally was a friend of mine, he looked at my reports that the teams were writing about me. And he was like, dude, are you, do you know what they saying about you? And I'm like, nah, what you talking about? Man, he was like, injury this, he can't make it through a season, this, that, the other. And he was less like, dude, you didn't had a long career. You didn't beat yourself today to the death. You need to just give it up. And I'm like, give it up. I still can play some more, you know. But then I went on a couple of workouts, and I was about to sign with Buffalo. And I, during the workout, I pulled my arm quad, and they wanted to sign it. And I was just like, man, maybe I, maybe I am, you know. Maybe I am. <laughs> didn't play this game too long, you know. So I had to go back and talk to myself and think. And then I went through a depression stage, like for like, literally I locked myself in the house and I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And it took me about, about two years, I say, just to figure out what I was trying to do. I was still getting up in the morning at six o'clock, you know, cause my life been on a routine since I was five. I've been playing sports since I was five years old. So my life been on a routine ever since I was a little boy. And then all of a sudden they say, it's done. Nobody calling your phone, nobody giving you a schedule or anything. You like, damn, what's next? What's next? So, like I said, I went through this depression stage and I was on a lot of pills and stuff for dealing with the pain and stuff from playing this game and just trying to get back into the game. And then I sat down and I just thought, I cut off all TVs. I got away from all my friends because your friends and stuff uh, have you thinking all kinds of stuff. I can never live down anything. I had been in fights all my life and all this stuff. So every time I go around them, they just keep on talking about this, that, and then everybody's asking about how you doing, man. What's going on with you? Yeah, they still right. think you this superhero 
when you got all this mental stuff going on and all this stuff is facing you and the bills ain't stopped, your mama's still calling you like, hey, I need this, I need that, I need this. <laughs> so I had to really just get away from everybody and come to who I wanted to be. And I started reading books and I read The Four Agreements and then the book called The Power of Now. And The Power of Now really like just woke me up because it was just like, you can you can change who you want to be. It's like your parents were taught what colors to like, what race to like, what to eat and all like this, but you have to get inside yourself and think of what do you want. And then once I started thinking like that, I was laying in bed one day and literally, I, I ain't gonna lie, I was on the, I was like on the point of like wanna kill myself. Cause I was in pain, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even lay flat on the bed. My neck was hurting and everything else. I turned on my sides, my shoulders were jacked up. And my coach came to me. It's my Little League coach who kind of raised me. And it's a funny, one of my homeboys wrote a book about my whole Little League program and stuff. It's called uh, Coach Darrell Coates Going For Two. And um, I played for that team. We was eight and two. But he came to me and he was like, get up and do what you know how to do. And he didn't come to me like in person, in spirit. And I'm laying in bed. I'm like, what? He said, get up and do something. Get off your ass. And I'm like, what? What am I to do? And I didn't know what to do. And he's like, do what you know to do. And I'm like, what do I know how to do? And I said, the one thing I know how to do is work. And I went to the gym. I started working out like a maniac. And I literally, I get up at six o'clock in the morning, go run, come back, make my shake for breakfast, run to the gym and work out. Then come back. Then I train with some high school kids or something, just doing drills and stuff. So I was doing this like daily. And then I started training people. And I trained people for like a year. I was like banking like probably $10,000 a month. Straight up, straight cash, training people. But I had no life. I was going from getting up at 4 30 in the morning, I wouldn't get in the house at 10 o'clock at night. And I mean, I trained people from sun up to sundown. Wow. And then I was just like, I can't do this no more. I was I was hurting, my body was hurting. Like I said, I'm still taking the drugs, not being able to eat good meals because I'm trying to grab stuff in between clients and stuff like this. So I was like, you know what? I got to get away from this. So I told all my clients, I was like, this is my last month. And I mean, I had some loyal people, so it was like kind of hard. I was living in Texas at the time. And then one of my homegirls called me and she was like, why don't you do a fitness competition? And, and the funny thing is, but I was doing all this working out. I was working out with my clients too, because I had my, my slogan to be like a pro train with a pro TJ Slaughter. So I actually worked out with everybody. I wouldn't even like, I wouldn't do, they, I wouldn't do my weights, I do their weights. And oh. you know, doing their weights to me was like doing nothing. So I was doing this probably six, seven times a day. So I had got shredded and ripped up. And my homegirl was like, dude, the fitness company. I'm like, I ain't doing that crap. You know, they ain't for me. I ain't get up there with them tight drawers on and all like that. And she was like, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. So she paid for it. And um, I did the fitness competition and I won. And then they sent me to Vegas. And then in Vegas, I was like my second fitness company. I didn't know what I was doing anything. I just follow a little diet plan and worked out like I normally do. This girl was standing in line and I never met her before a day in my life. And she said, uh, can I do a photo shoot with you? And I'm like, why me? And then she's like, you just got a different vibe about you. You just something different about you. I'm like, yeah, sure. As long as I can have some of the pictures. So make a long story short, when I go to my room to check in, this girl is right next door to me. And she's with four girls and I'm in the room by myself and I'm like, Wow, this is crazy. I just met you in line and now you in the room right next to me. Never met a day in my life or anything else. So make a long story short, um, did the photo shoot, with, photo shoot with her, got some of the pictures, put them on a uh, website. My homeboy, I put them on Facebook and my homeboy runs Ava Talent in New Orleans. And he was like, yo, TJ, can I put these your pictures on my website? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. And then as soon as he put the pictures on my website, probably a week later, he called me like, dude, can you act? And I'm like, yeah, I can act. I've been acting my whole life, you know? Act the fool! And, <laughs> and this cat like, no, dude, can you act for real? He said, do you got any reels? And I was like, oh, man, I ain't did no acting, but I act like I like people and I act all kind of ways, you know? <laughs> so then he told me, I did. I had did a short, and this is how God works, because I just always, I said, I stopped doing what TJ say do. I said, God give me divine guidance in everything I do. So I did a short film in San Antonio, Texas, with uh, this lady, and the short film was the exact character that the dude wanted me to play in the film. And I landed an acting gig. I ain't never acted there in my life. 
<laughs> and I fly out of New Orleans. It's like Tommy from Martin was in it. Oh. And all these A-list actors, some B and C-list actors. But I had a love scene in that. And I ain't never at. <laughs> and this girl, and I'm like, I'm like, I got to do what? I got to make love? I got to, on camera? You know? Was she pretty? So like, huh? Was she pretty? Oh, yeah, she was bad now. She was bad. <laughs> <laughs> so the funny thing is, though, she was cool. Because when she came in the room, she was like, who is Keith? Then some girl like, that's Keith right there. She was like, ooh. <laughs> How you gonna slam me against the wall? Don't be bumping my head, you know. Let's came up to be like, oh, just hood. And I was like, okay, one of these. I'm like, hey, do you know who you're talking to? I will jack you up, you know. And she's like, boy, come on, we need to rehearse these lines because don't be bumping my head and stuff. And I'm like, okay, this girl could have cool. So we started hitting it off and we did the scene together and like I had never acted before like I said never been on camera doing any like real acting and literally you take like a hundred takes of making out with somebody and yeah. I mean like and it starts like it ain't like you start from the beginning the whole time it's like you put your mouth on his chest okay you get in the booth action you know and you go <laughs> from this point on and you, you, you're doing all this stuff so it was like it was a, a so real Learning process, but I like to be through in the fire anyway. So I learned hands on really quick. Some of the stuff I couldn't do, like they told me to cry on camera. I couldn't cry for shit. But like, think about this, think about this. I thought, like, dude, I can't cry. I said, I've been told my whole life not to cry and suck it up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but um, through that process, moved out to LA, and then I was burning a hole in my pocket. I hear I was doing 50 million commercials. I was, I was commercial, <laughs> back, 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 back. But commercials don't pay no money out here, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you could get a national, you might make $5,000 or something, but that's rent out here, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> I started getting into real estate, started doing some investing and stuff, but then I got some real estate with um, some stuff going on and started doing that. But then I started like, my pain started getting to the worst of me. Like I was doing all the, every time I do something, they had me doing action or running, or I was doing stunts too. And then I'm like jumping in the cabinet, falling, I'm like, dang, my knee really hurt, you know? So I'm taking these drugs, like, okay. I said, all right, just like I'm playing the game. Then I do something and then like I turn or something in the film on the set and I'm, oh, you know, and it's like immediately you get these pains that I ain't never realized I ever had before. So stuff would just hurt me everywhere. I mean, from being able to walk to ankle pains to some days my head hurt so bad, I could remember shit. They were like, TJ, you uh, gotta know your lines. I'm like, dude, I ain't even want nobody to talk to me. And I said, before I get up and cuss somebody out and knock somebody out on this, on this set and really blew my chances, I need to step away for a minute and see what's going on with me. And then I started realizing like I was having memory problems. Then I started realizing like my, uh, I had, uh, I was, like I said, I was bone on bone in my knee. Never knew my meniscus was gone or anything like this. I've been playing football. They say, you ain't got a meniscus. And they say, your top layer and your bottom layer of college is gone. So you need to do a knee replacement. I'm like, a knee replacement? I'm like, dude, I'm 43. I don't need no knee replacement. And he's like, no. Nah. I said, I run. I said, it just hurts some days. He's like, no, nah, it was jump pretty bad. Then I would go look at my shoulder. they like, this is the shoulder I had surgery on when I was with the Jaguars anyway. And he was like, dude, you need a shoulder replacement. I'm like, well, what's going on? Is my rotator cup gone? Is my labrum gone again or what? He was like, your whole capsule, everything destroyed. You need a shoulder replacement. I was like, well, I still got strength. He said, whatever you're doing, you need to keep doing it because your muscle structure is the only reason your shoulders stand together. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay. Then I, I go to squat one day and I ain't doing them like 135. And I squat down, my back just go out on me, like totally go out on me. And I drop the weight. I'm like, what's wrong with my back? So then I'm like trying to get up. I mean, I couldn't even like this. It lasted for like two weeks. I couldn't put on my pants. I couldn't bend over. I could barely get out of bed. I'm like, what in the world is going on? So everything then, was hurt on you, but your feet. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't do nothing. So I was like, what's going on? So they tell me that um, I got spinal stenosis. So I'm like, okay, yeah. how do I fix that? Then it was like, oh, you can do a nerve blocker. I'm like, nerve blocker? I said, if you block my nerve, then I can't feel nothing. Then if I, something really happened, I'm jacked up. So I'm like, nah, I just keep taking the pills. Taking the pills, I go to the doctor one day. They're like, your right kidney function at 50% and you got protein in your piss, so your liver going bad and all this. I'm like, what? So then I was like, okay, I got to cut back on the pills to try to 
get it, but I can't take the pills because I'm in so much pain. So what I'm gonna do? I'm like going crazy now. I'm like really like struggling, like going crazy and trying to figure out. But I, you know, I'm TJ. I'm I'm the Superman. I'm get slaughtered. You know, I'm the bad boy out of the family. So I really can't call my mom and say, "Mom, what I'm doing?" I ain't never really called my mom about that to complain about. I ain't had nobody I could talk to, so I'm internalizing all this stuff. Internalizing all this stuff causing me to stress and go crazy. And then I'm trying to look up stuff. I'm finding natural ways for this. Like I became, I became like a doctor for myself because I was trying to look up natural ways for this, natural ways for that, and just trying to get off the drugs to help my pain. Then I'm living in Cali, so I started venturing into the marijuana. But I didn't like to smoke. I tried to smoke first, and I'm like, I ain't no smoker. That ain't, ain't even my style. So I started the edibles. So the edibles helped me, really started helping me. But I couldn't do that. I was like, out of it. Like, edibles made me feel good, but I didn't, I didn't know who I was or what I was. I couldn't function on them, basically. So I had to find the right thing and the right amount to make me feel good. But now I'm doing okay. You know, I say I have my good days, I have my bad days. But the thing is, I know myself now. So sometimes I can get up in the morning, I'd be like, okay, I'm pretty good. Don't let me do too much. I do like a veggie shake. I don't even eat breakfast no more. I do shakes for breakfast and stuff like that because I had to change my whole diet because I couldn't run as much and all of this. And I didn't want to blow up because I hold weight like a big dog. So <laughs> then I started just pickpocketing everything. So I studied my whole body and basically find out what I can do, what I can't do, what I like, what I don't like. And I'll tell you, my house is like a, my pantry is like a, a GNC store because <laughs> I got so much crap. But it's a whole bunch of natural stuff, but I have to take different things because the one thing you learn about your human body, you get used to stuff. So once you start taking some, your body get used to it. So you got to switch that crap out and try something else, then come back to that. And then switch it up. So everything, even with working out, you got to change it up, change it up. So I swim a lot now too, because the water, Dude, really? I don't know. Yeah, something about water relaxes me. It, 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 yeah, it takes, it takes, it makes me feel totally different. It gives me a sense of peace and just listening to the water makes me yeah, feel I like better. Too. I mean, yeah, you look pretty cut. I mean, you look like you, you all right now. You be still <laughs> you know, like this now. I mean, you ain't looking like me, but but you know, I'm almost there. This is this is the thing. I never want nobody to know what's wrong with me. You know, you yeah. never know who's out to get you or who's coming for you or anything else. So, even if I have, if I'm walking in front of people, if it hurts to limp, I ain't gonna limp. You know what I'm saying? I just have this pride about me that won't allow me to do that. So if I'm limping really bad, or if my knee killing me, I suck it up and take the pain just to look straight so everybody don't sit. Now, when I get home, I might fall on the floor like, God oh, damn, my knee hurt, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I ain't gonna show the world that I'm hurt because I don't know who had the bus head back in the day or whatever. So I I, I mean, I'd have done a lot of crazy <laughs> stuff back in the day. Hey, Big hey, John, though, hey, we hey, used to get it in. <laughs> hey man, you ain't lying, but look here, a short, a quick story that you, while you were talking about that, Look, man, I thought I was gonna do that with the Jaguar. I thought about it. I had the cane in the car. I don't want the cane. No, I don't want no wheelchair. I'm uh -huh. trying. It, it, bruh, I, I wish I had your fighting because I couldn't do it. I said, I, I, thought, I thought about walking that whole stadium with uh -huh. nothing. I said, no, I had to take my cane. So, man, yeah, I understand, man, but I don't know, man. I try, I try every day. I try all the time, T. I try to work out. But five, four hours later, I'm down. I can't help yeah. the baby. I can't do nothing with the baby. Everything swell. I was like, I'm like you. I thought I was listening to my whole story over again. Everything mm -hmm. you said happened to me. And I just couldn't. I, and I would have been in wheelchairs. I, I still walk with a cane now because I can't walk for a long time. Yeah, I walk with a cane sometime. And it, but then I put that thing, I put it up. I have I have like a whole set of canes down there, yeah. and I use it like late at night, like I yeah. like at midnight I go for a late night walk, and I carry my cane. But if I go out in the daytime, like Lil, I can I be limping, and I see a car drive by, and I try to straighten up. It is just natural. <laughs> like, I'm like, well, what? Why, who am I trying to impress? You know, but it's just natural. I don't want to well, like yeah. I said. It. That's okay. That's, that's so, how I felt about it, man. Hold on, one, one more thing, cause I, I do mine for. 
Look at me. You think my son or my wife can pick me up? No. <laughs> yeah. So they can't. So I thought about it, and that's why one of the reasons too I walk with it. They yeah. could hold it if I pull myself if I ever fall. If yes, something sir. ever give out. So I gotta think about hell, who go help me <laughs> when I can't get up. So, okay, hey, TJ. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. TJ, he full yeah. of it because the joker didn't have no problem falling on me. <laughs> oh my, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that joker fell on me. He fell on me. Talking about, hey. Hold me, Tony. Man, I can't hey. hold you. <laughs> hey. hey, if Stark, if, 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 if uh, who is it? Scotty Starks can hold me up because he caught me when I fell out the hot tub when I passed out. He caught yeah. me. You ever seen Stark, uh, Scotty Stark? He looked. DB, mm -hmm. he held big hand up. He had it, man. I love that little guy for that. Boy. <laughs> I would have been, I would have been probably face down on the, uh, you know, when we go in the hot tub at. Yeah, he caught me right there, TJ. I was coming off the step, man, and it just, I passed out. Guess it was too long in the hot tub, but whatever I did, yeah, my blood pressure was sky high, and he caught me right there, bro. I was going face. Hey, you look, he caught you, cause yeah, man. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't, I done got out of bed here. Like, I started having blackout spells. And one night I got out of bed here, and my girl was in the bed, and um, I just was finna go downstairs and blacked out, fell down the stairs. Oh, oh, God damn. And I'm like, so she work out, come out there. She's like, you okay, you okay? And I'm like, I'm like I really didn't even know what happened because I blacked out, you know? So I just, yeah. I knew I was at the top, but I was at the bottom. And then, I bruised my, I thought I broke my arm because my, my elbow was like really bruised up and stuff and knotted up and then it turned like all purpose stuff. But she was like, you want me to call the doctor? I'm like, nah, just let me sit here for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got up just, and I moved out. Just let me lay here for a minute. You, yeah, you just let me lay here for a minute. I laid there for a minute, then I finally got up and shook it off. But then I started talking to my, I called my doctor and told him what happened. He's like, why do you call the hospital? Why you do this? He's like, TJ, you gotta quit being so stubborn. That's what I realized. I'm, it's like we upheld this image. And this image we've been taught our whole life. To be strong, to be brave, don't cry. And you remember, when we, even when we got to leave, when talk, Coffin was there, it's like, it ain't no injury. It ain't no soft tissue injury. You gotta oh, break yeah. something and all like that. And he don't wanna hear your mouth. <laughs> and we always, there's somebody always behind us trying to take us, take our spot. So we built to think, do not tell what's wrong with you. And I still had that mentality. And then when you oh, so when you Lord. go to the doctors, you don't you don't tell them everything. You don't you it's it's hard for me to sit up there and say, man, I'm fucking fucked up. You know, it's just hard for me to say that. And then So TJ, yeah. Let me ask you this while you're on that. Now, so so Minshew went a couple of weeks, didn't tell nobody his finger was hurt, broke, whatever. So and Big John and I had an argument about this. I said, man, he should have told somebody. Because, you know, he put it in jeopardy. But I know, I get what you're saying. I remember the Coughlin days. I remember, I, I remember, I, I felt bad for all y'all. I remember the Coughlin days. Coughlin's <laughs> shit. If, if you if you wasn't bleeding and the ambulance wasn't taking you out, you had to play. <laughs> That's right. And if not, they was going to shoot you up with something so you didn't feel nothing. <laughs> like I, oh. I never oh. heard a tort all and any of that stuff till I got to the league and I, I'm sitting up there getting my ankles taped one day and dudes coming out the back room, they all of them got band-aids on their butt. So they go in to see a doctor and they come out with their pants halfway down with a band-aid on their butt. I'm like, what the hell going on over there? <laughs> and they were like, tort all. I'm like, tort all, what's that? Your I'm your like your freaking out. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I ain't never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to get my first total shirt shot, you know, and I'm just like, okay, is this okay? Yeah, but ain't nobody telling you what effects it got on you. I, pro I told him, I said, I done took so many banned drugs that's now on the banned drugs list. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, that was feeding me Vox, all this crap, Innocent, <laughs> and like Cellar Bricks. I mean, I ate that junk like candy. After we get through playing the game, we get on the plane. What they give us? Bike it in the volumes, right there on the plane. Him. They don't say eat. No, they don't say eat first. Eat first before you take this. You know, they just say him. So the first thing we doing is, I'm in pain. I got to sit on this plane. Empty stomach. It's killing your liver and your kidneys. Immediately. So how does how do players? And, and I don't know if they still do that. Because if you ask anybody, they'll say they don't. But they stop. Yeah. How do you prevent for you guys, man, getting addicted to that stuff? 
or did, did a lot of players get addicted and they just kept it up under the rug? I think all of us addicted to painkillers. If you yeah. pay, if you play a uh, D line, running back, linebacker position where you banging constantly, that first week when we put helmets on and we bang, I don't know a player that went taking some kind of painkiller for headaches. Cause your head got to get used to this. You got to get used to your brain being shook around. I used to take two little, three little bottles when we get ready to start training camp and I used to beat my head. And people be like, I'm crazy. I'm like, dude, I'm getting ready for training camp. And I used to take it and just <laughs> smack my head because the first couple of licks you hit each other you rattle your brain. I don't care if you've been training and your your physical can be the best. Your head ain't ready to take them blows right off the bat. So it takes like a week or two to adjust, to just get used to banging dudes 24 seven. And then once you get that, you can probably wing yourself a little bit here and there, but I took pain pills every day. Even on practice, I took pain pills. We had to, if we had to bang, I took pain pills. And then on Friday and Saturday, they were my healing days and I was taking like, two, uh, four Indicin a day just to get the inflammation out of my body to be ready to play on Sunday. And if we had a short week, I probably overdosed on everything to get ready to play. <laughs> <laughs> so now you do know that all that stuff that y'all name, now they say if you take it more than a week, you get addicted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. But like I said, back in the day, you know, that this is the same thing. I used to run down on kickoff bust the wedge and go straight to playing defense. And I wouldn't even know where I am. And then I come to the sideline, some ammonia, throw it in your nose and let's go. But nowadays you get a little head bang, you get to sit out a week. I mean, I think I said, if, if that was the case, hell, I probably would have never got to play. <laughs> so how many concussions do you think you got, TJ? Well, this is what I tell you. I have four con concussions was I was completely knocked out where I don't remember what happened from point A to point B and nothing in between. How many times I done went out for like two or three seconds or five seconds hit somebody? Millions of times. I mean, I didn't hit linemen straight head up and blanked out when I hit them and then came to and still had my hands on them like this. Just because the blow of the head, just like bam, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And it's the hardest thing to hit. I was, we was always taught to hit your target center. To split your target, hit with lead with your head, see your see your see your opponent, hit through the hit through the body. Now they talk to lean and give you half the body. If I seen Fred Taylor coming at me or Stacy Mack, I ain't giving him half of my body. That's a big boy. I need to hit him with everything I got. So I'm a four fit. <laughs> you know, so that's why I look at it. So if you tell me to turn half of my body and this fool gonna be to put his head in my neck, uh hit me in my temple, I might go to sleep. I was Stacey always talking to this. Yeah. <laughs> I still talk to this. How you been, Have you been? How many concussions have you had? Have you uh, same thing with him? Yeah. Yeah, I had. Oh, but I remember. I think I had, I had four. Yeah, I think yeah. I had four. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like he said, man. You, I was shut off the mind, and I was getting ready to play Denver, and Jack came in there because – when I got to mile high, I got off the plane. I'm seeing damn what's I'm Joe looking Joe looking at me. I'm just looking at the sky at, at the plane like this. Like you are, I guess. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was just thought I was straight, but man, whatever he saw in my eyes, I couldn't I couldn't play. They weren't gonna let me. It, so, it's, it's, it's that. That's how that's how crucial it is, man. So TJ, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull my shovel out now so I can dig a little bit. Okay, I did it, John, so I'm going to do it to you. Okay. So, transition from Coughlin to Del Rio, and, and how does that work? And 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 how does all that – I know John answered this the other week, and, and a couple other players have answered this, and it's funny. You tell me, what's that transition like going from – because I know what Coughlin's about, but I really didn't get to meet Del Rio, so I don't know what that's about. How is that transition? Well, this is what I'm gonna tell you about Kaufman. Kaufman reminded me, cause I was drafted to Jacksonville. He was just like my little league coach, my high school coach, my college coach. Right. He didn't cut no corners. He gonna give it to everybody. And he didn't care who you were. He told everybody the same thing. He, he laid it out to you. And if he like you, 
he might give you a grin, a uh, pat on the butt here and there, but he still was gonna get in your A, just like anybody else. Del Rio came, and he he played. He he wanted to be a players coach one day, then he wanted to be strict and neck, and he yeah, had his favorites. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He had his favorites, and I didn't understand. We were losing at the time. You know, we weren't doing good that season, but somehow or another, he wanted to bench me. I don't know why, but he wanted to put me on the bench. And I remember I came in against, I think it was against Houston or somebody, and I stopped somebody on the goal line, and I had a a, a, a big hit. And then they interviewed me, and they was like, well, how do you feel now? You came in, you had a good game, and um, Dario still haven't put you as a starter. And I'm like, what you want me to do? I can't do nothing. I can't go down there and cuss him out or beat him up because he ain't – Put me as a starter. What I'm gonna do is play ball and do my best. And um, if he move me up, I will play. And they took it, and they ran down there and took took it to him. The next day, because they wrote it in the middle, well, T.J. had Slaughter had two choices, either to go down there and cuss Jack there or out there. And then the media guy even told him he didn't say it like that. But he had like I offended him in the worst way, and I said, dude, I ain't even say it like that. They just turned my words and used them against me, and they wrote it like they wanted to write it. And from that point on, like I said, he had a conflict with me. I don't know what it was or whatever, but I wasn't happy. And I ain't gonna walk around the locker room cheering and being nice if we lose it. Cause I'm a type of person that I know this job consists of, we gotta be win W's. And I ain't never been a loser in all my life. We got to win. So I ain't happy if we ain't winning. So y'all like, here come my smile. Like smile for what? We ain't winning, you know? And I'll be looking and I had, a, I got a mean mug like, now I kind of try to smile more because I'm in the world and people are like, damn, dude, you like you're gonna kill somebody. You like you're gonna kill somebody. <laughs> then I got these eyes. So it when people look at me, they already like, then I and I'm looking like this, and they like, oh, are you mad? I'm like, no, nah, I ain't mad, man. It's just the sun in my face or something. Walk so, around like Devo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> but the, the difference between them is Coffin was steady. He was who he, who he was. Like, you knew who Coffin was 24-7. When Jack came in, like I said, I didn't know who he was. I, like I said, one day he'll be cool. Next day he'll be, his finger up his butt. He'll be Coffin, <laughs> to put it that way. <laughs> so what was it like after Jacksonville? How did you know, get your first after you left Jacksonville? Well, you got, so I got arrested in uh, Jacksonville. And that's when they, quote, unquote, gave the Jack Del Rio a reason to release me. And that was like the the biggest slap in my face ever. Cause I was like, I was like I was leading the team on tackles and um, I got released right in the middle of the season. That's when we had Jimmy Smith uh, had got arrested and then the punter hit hit his leg with the ax, I think. And uh, so I was the- I remember that. The, yeah, so they said they was making an example out of me. And actually I had talked to Jack when I got out of jail that morning came to him, he's like, look, we'll see what happened later. We'll talk to you about it. Don't worry about it and all like this. Then the next day I go in to go to treatment. They, they Somebody's meet me at the front door and take me to the back office. And they said, we're gonna release you. I'm like, release me? What? I'm like, this is my home. This is Jack, I'm TJ Slaughter. Why are you gonna release me? And he was like, oh, we don't think you meet. There's no, no, no problems with you and everything, but we don't think you meet what we're trying to do. I'm like, oh, okay. So Green Bay came in. I didn't want to go to Green Bay. I'm just going to be honest. I was like, in Florida, it's like 90 degrees. I fly, <laughs> out, to Green, I fly out to Green Bay, and I got out of the plane. It's like five degrees. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And then it's like, you just going for a workout. Now, this is my first time ever being released from a team. I started in Jacksonville, everything. I get up there. I just bring a duffel bag, like a little book bag with some clothes in and stuff. and. Uh, they want us to I work out, and I kill the workout. And they're like, we're going to sign you. I'm like, sign me? Yeah, like, yeah, right now. I said, well, I got to go home and get some clothes. They're like, no, you ain't going home. I'm like, what? I'm like, I ain't got nothing but this bag. He was like, well, this is the high performance business. You know, you're making big bucks now. Buy new stuff. I have somebody mail it to you. I was like, I ain't married. I ain't got no wife. I ain't got no girl staying with me. I live by myself. You know, they were like, ain't our problem. I got to go, my home. mama. <laughs> Yeah, so it shocked me. Like it was like a slap in my face because I was like, "Dude, I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I knew Brett Favre and I knew a couple of players, but I'm leaving the South 
where it's hot. These guys got to rent. I had to rent a four by four because it's black ice and snow all over the road. I'm staying in a hotel. I ain't got no bathtub. I ain't got nothing that I normally have. And they tell me to play a season. And I'm sitting up here like, I can't even go to the grocery store. I don't even know the grocery stores at anything. So they're trying to tell me here and there. There was nothing in Green Bay at that time but Brett Favre's restaurant. And it was the worst. <laughs> It was the worst. Like, I was ready to quit playing football. I, I was. I was just like, I'm done. I, like, I used to call my agent every day and like, dude, get me out of here. Get me out of here. But and who was there when you were there? Huh? Who was that Green Bay when you was there? Because I know uh, – I, I, I never figured this out. Yeah, Charker there. Edgar, Edgar Bennett and Leroy Butler are from here, and they love staying up there. Yeah, you, you can just love it there if you don't want to do nothing. There ain't nothing to do but play video games. I ain't no video game that guy. And like all these guys be like, me away. come on, man, play video games. I'm like, dude, I don't play no damn video games. I just never <laughs> had played video games. So I'm like, I tried to go out, to hang out somewhere. The worst. It was the that worst. No I'm, just, I'm just saying, I ain't going to say where I was going and how I was going and what I was trying to do, but <laughs> we gotta it know. was the worst. You know. Hey. It would be if I would have stayed there. I probably have. I ain't got no kids right now, but I probably would have had about five kids because it wasn't nothing to do. All you see was people getting people pregnant because there's nothing to do and it's cold <laughs> as hell outside. So I got released from there, and literally I was happy. I ain't gonna even lie, I was happy. And I went. I flew home to Alabama, and I was like on the plane. And my as soon as I got off the plane, I had like five messages from my agent, like, "Dude, where are you?" I'm like, "I'm on the plane. I'm in Birmingham." He like turn around and rock back in the airport. And I'm like, what? I was like, dude, I ain't playing football. I'm done. I said, fuck this. Like, literally, because all my life, football has been, like my family, has been a catalyst to me. Like, every coach was like my father. Even Tom Coffin was a cool cat. I mean, like I said, he delivered it to me, and we sat down to talk about 50 million things, even though he used to find me for fighting and stuff like that. I ain't like that. But... I was able to have a conversation with and understand what he wanted and what he was looking for. Jack, I just didn't totally understand. I ain't, I ain't know what he was looking for, what he wanted me to do. I thought we were going to be cool because we were both linebackers. And I'm like, hey, we can do this thing. But yeah. that, I well, we know guy, he so put on a whatever. suit. Once he put on a suit, it was over. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so when I got when I when I got to Birmingham, I was like I said, I was I was done. I was like, I'm done. And then he was like, Baltimore wants, wants to uh, bring you in. And I was like, man, I am I need to think about it. And he's like, you got, he called them and told me he'll be on the, I guess he told them he was, I was going to be on the first flight in the morning. But he told me I had 24 hours to think about it. And I went home and I just seen my home situation with my mom and my brother and stuff. I'm like, you know what? Shit, I need to get out of here. I got to do something. Yeah. So I flew up to Baltimore the next morning. And that's when um, I played with Adeus Thomas, Chad Williams, Raymond Walls, all in college. So it was four guys, three guys from my college team on the team. And so I was like, you know what, we can do this. Then I seen Ray Lewis and I seen oh. Ed Hartwell. And I was like, ooh, competition. <laughs> and that's what I needed. I needed to see them. And once I seen them, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna show them who the real, who the real. <laughs> we had played them in Jacksonville and all that stuff. So, and then I met Mike Singletary and I was like, okay, we can do this. Yeah. And I fell in love with the game again. Wow. And that's when I started falling in love with the game again. But they tricked me too. Oh, and I'll tell you how they, I'll tell you how they tricked me. <laughs> so when I signed with them, they wanted me to, they wanted me to sign a two year deal. And I'm like, okay, I'll sign a two year deal. Cause I always want to sign a one year deal and be back free. Right. I said, I signed a two year deal. If you promise me, we, me and Ed Hartwell got open competition next year. Ozzie Newsom, yes, TJ, done deal. Because Ed is in his last year, and you'll be in your last year, so it's an open competition. I knew nobody going to touch Ray Lewis, because like I said, I like Ray, he's a cool <laughs> dude, but he got, he got he had some pull up that I ain't never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> that a linebacker have. Yeah. Like, you know, Ray, Ray has a different, different situation. Like I said, like, if I told Big John to hold that lineman up and don't let him get on me, he'd be like, teacher, what the hell are you talking about? You better fill that gap, you know? I got a talent of him. Now, with Ray, they say, don't nobody touch Ray. He like a quarterback <laughs> on the defensive side. I'm like, how did you get this system? Because I've been budding lineman my whole career. You know, you got to get off the block, get off the block. Mm -mm. 
they don't want nobody to touch Ray. Ray need to run straight to the ball. So I don't know how he got that situation, but I, like I said, I was cool with it. For him, I was like, God bless you, brother. I don't know how you did it, but keep doing it. Yeah. So we come into the next year, and we went to the playoffs that year. We lost to Tennessee in the playoffs. Then we come in the next year, and I beat Ed Hartwell out. He he had a sore hamstring or something, but I, on paper and film, I beat him and, and Ray Harden in play. So I, truthfully, I beat both of them out. But they never told me I didn't. I wasn't getting to start a job. So all of a sudden, we go to the banquet, the the uh, sponsors banquet, and we're there, and everybody goes on stage, and it's like T.J. Slaughter would be bagging up Ed Hartwell and Ray Lewis, and I'm like, huh? You know, I like I went I went straight to Ozzy. I said, yo, what's up, man? I said I didn't beat this cat out. Why ain't getting to start a job? He told me, you ought to be happy you have a job. And that was the first time football slapped me in the face and showed me that it ain't about the best player. It ain't about nothing. It's about you doing what you told and showing them that you can respond to command. And I said what other any normal dude that I think would say, but I was like, who the fuck you talking to? <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that, like, I got mad because like I said, to me, he kind of lied to me in my face. And then to me, if a man lied to you in your face, then you ain't got respect for me. So I want to fight you. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm from the South. So you got to speak up for what you want. And I spoke up. I was like, man, I like Lily. I, I said some stuff to him that I probably shouldn't have said at the time. Because like I said, there was it was through in my face in a way that I had never seen before. Right. So I reacted out of anger. He caught and you off guard. They went... Re- yeah, he called me told off guard. So I told him I'd like release me. He like, we ain't releasing you. And I called my agent, they won't release me. So I played that and we played, I think that's the that that year we played uh we played Cleveland Browns, the first open the game, I think. And that's when Andre Davis cussed Ray Lewis out and it went on right. He like, fuck you, bitch. And it went, excuse me, I don't know if I can say that on TV. You can yeah, say that. Like, say like, that. You can say that. Yeah. But he said, fuck you, and it went over the loudspeaker because they had the mic on flipping the coin and then they beat us and that was my first time in my life in my life i've been playing football since i was five years old in my life just playing special teams now i bought out on special teams but i was pissed like i was like mad than i had ever been like i was so mad so i went home and i called my i talked to my little league coach he had called me like hey i seen you you ain't play no defense all this what's going on i was like I'm like, man, I'm 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 pissed. I don't know what to do. He said, do what you've been taught to do. He said, go to practice and wear they A out at practice. And I'm like, okay, exactly. So we played Pittsburgh the next week. And they had, that's when Kendra Bell used to bliss over the center. So I went there and I said, give me his jersey because I'm finna F up everything. And every <laughs> play I just ran down, blew up the center, like blew his ass up. And they were cussing me. I mean, them linemen were so mad at me. They were calling me all kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know me. I played it. And I was like, I was bragging. I'm like, I played at Jacksonville. Nigga, I bust you in, the, bust you then, and I busted you now, you know? So I'm, I'm like going at them. And like after practice, I'm about to have, fight the whole O-line by myself. And, and Darius Thomas grabbed me, and I'm like cussing them all out. I'm like that mad. I'm like, I don't give a, I ain't care. So the funny thing is, the next day, that's when Big Zeus was around uh, before he passed away. But Zeus, me and him were good guys. He's a good guy today. And um, we go to practice. They were like, we're going to get him. We're going to get him. And I was like, whatever wow. y'all do, you touch me. I said, I will literally F up all y'all. Because I didn't, I literally, I, I'm from, like I told people all the time, I fought a lot of JVL. I fought a lot everywhere I went. But the thing people didn't know, I'm from Alabama. Everybody ever, ever thought Alabama was just a country Hick town. I'm like, nah, dude, we used to get it in. Alabama, why? Crazy. So you had to defend yourself. So that's yeah. where I grew up. So I didn't understand when you fight, it stop on the field. And when I fought, I'm, I'm trying to maim you, you know? And even though you're my teammate, I didn't look at it like that because I look at it like, this is my food. You're trying to hurt me. So I'm trying to hurt you. If you holding me, are you jacking me in the back? You're trying to make me strain my hamstring or something like that. So I looked at everything you did to offend me was trying to hurt me in some kind of way. So I acted out on everything. And I you got, got in a big fight, fight up there. Oh, we fought, we fought in practice all the time. <laughs> Colin was, normally he was cool with it, but then I got too many fights, he started finding me. And then one time I got the fight in the locker room. 
Yeah. You remember that? No. With Danny Clark. <laughs> oh no, I know you and Dick. <laughs> yeah, I got to fight in the locker room. So, <laughs> but it, it, it's it's a it's a part of the game, you know. It's we like brothers, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It ain't like. I get to fight with my brother and all like this. It's, it's a thing. We're going to have disagreements. And it's okay to fight and everything else. My problem is I didn't know I let shit go. And that's the thing. Like, if I fought you, I still looked at you in a nigga way. Like, if I see you as a street, I might get you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that was my problem. And, and that was something I had within me. You know what I'm saying? That I had to grow out of and learn that, you know, this is a camaraderie sport. So I'm going to have disagreements with stuff. And I'm going to have times when people get on my nerves. But yes, like I said, I, I was raised a different way. And people didn't know that until they got to know me. And they're like, okay, you might be a little crazy, Slaughter. And I'm like, is that what you call it crazy? We call that normal where I'm from. Right. You know? <laughs> so what happened after Baltimore? What did you go? Oh, I, I went to Baltimore, played there. And then they offered me a deal at the end of the year, more than anybody else. But I turned it down because to me, I was pissed at Ozzie Newsom for lying to me. And I said, no amount of money that somebody can pay me was more better than respect for me. So I didn't care. But when I turned it down, probably the worst thing I did because <laughs> I was a nuisance them black ball. And I didn't know nothing. I'm like, I'm gonna get picked up by somebody else. I ain't worried. I ain't had a bad season. I'm this, that, and all that. Other. And then nobody was picking me up. And then like two games in the training camp, the Saints called. And I was in Miami working out. I literally jumped in my car. They said I had to fly out that morning. I jumped in the car, drove from Miami, because I'm working out of Miami, to Jacksonville, locked my stuff down and jumped on a plane to the Saints. And they signed me there on the spot, and I played that week. But when I went to go visit, Jim Haslett was the coach there, and he was like, dude, do you know what they're saying about you? And I'm like, what, what are you saying about you? And I literally, I had to explain to him everything I've went through and how I got to the point I was at, because these people was writing the worst crap in the world about me. And none of it was true. Because I've always been a player's coach. If my coach told me, and, and you can go back to Kaufman days when I was a rookie in my sec second year and everything, when Gans was there was a special team coordinator, I used to run down on kickoff, bust a wedge, or take out their biggest guy, and go straight to playing defense. And I ain't complain. I ain't do anything. I think it made me, uh, later on in my career, and it made me get more injuries because I was just – wedge buster and everything else and going straight to defense. But I, if a coach told me to run through a wall and you showed me you care for me, I would have ran through that wall for you. But TJ, that's where I was. That's where I was raised. Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Because I, I always, they beat me up about this and you brought up a good point. So listening to your story and then watching these young kids now. So I was pretty pissed about this whole thing that happened when Coughlin got fired. And you heard all the players say, oh, my God, he's so mean to me. Oh, he talked to me so bad. Oh, <laughs> is that where we are in football? It, it, has it changed to where, where men are men and now it's just if you yell at me too much, I'm going to tell on you? Because <laughs> can't nobody work this for coffee. This, <laughs> this is what I'm going to tell you. I talked to Mike Sanitary. In it down. My senior share is very old school. But he reminds me so much of my coach. What to get the best out of a young fella or uh, to to do things with sometimes you gotta be dismissed. Kids and right off the jump. So first of all, you gotta know your player. But then the player has to have a certain level of respect for a coach. It ain't one-way street. A coach can yell at you, and you shouldn't take offense to it because he's just trying to get the best of you. If you don't respond well to that and you don't want to be yelled at, then don't F up to get yelled at. So sometimes you got to take the responsibility as a player. But everybody these days, they want coaches to adapt to players, but they don't want players to adapt to coaches. And it got to be a little bit of both. You see what I'm saying? And that's what I feel. Kaufman is a... Old school, guy, old school guy, it's his way out of the highway. And that's where he taught it. So I knew if we was losing and not having a good time, Coffin's going to be an asshole. He going he gonna to find you if you're wearing the wrong color shot, socks. He find me one time because I had an earring in my nose because <laughs> we were losing. But when we winning, you're going to get away with that. 
He don't care. It's a, it's a little bit more lean. So the players got to know, but these days you can't say nothing to players. You can't, like, you can't slap a player on the helmet. I'm like, dude, what you talking about? My coach used to grab me by my face, man. Why don't make me get in your, you know? So right. people always ask me, you know, TJ, I want you to coach. I want you to coach. I want you to coach. But I say, look, I still got that dog in me. Like, if a young kid come talking to me, I ain't going to say I'm too old. I'm like, I'm going to put my foot in your eight, you know? And two, <laughs> you, I can look at a kid when they, when they mouth and mouth to me or saying something to me that I don't like and say, I'm not going to butt heads with you and try to fight you. And I can say, young fella, you can do it my way or get off the field. I ain't ready to coach. So I ain't going to play with myself. Right. And that's the thing I think. Some of these coaches are old school. Like I feel Mike Singletary, Tom Kaufman, coaches I've been around are very old school. That's why, yeah. And in and, and these days, um, players ain't like that. Like I had Sherman in Green Bay. That's what I had, I think Mike Sherman or Sherman, Sherman, Sherman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. and Green Bay. But then after Baltimore, I went, I mean, after New Orleans, I went to San Francisco. Back with Singletary and Mike Nolan. So hey. I bounced around for a bit, but you know, it was it was a good experience. You know, I wouldn't trade it for the world because it has taught me so much. And it's like football is a game that's like, if everybody's not playing well, somebody got to make a play. Somebody got to step up. If you tie and you like fourth, it's like fourth down and this guy over there breathing down your throat, you know, you got to suck it up. And you, even though you're tired and say, I got a man this guy because, you know, you everything we do on camera and it's not, we can't hide nothing. So if, I get on my back. It's gonna be brought up in film. TJ getting slammed on this. So our business is so critiqued and so looked at. You gotta know all these guys are prideful. It's one thing. All all us was all Americans. All us was the truth in high school, That's college. Right. So you gotta have some sense of pride and ego when you come to this game. But when you get in this room, it's the elite of the elite. So those who are fake gonna fall by the wayside. Real quick, and those who are well, man, real gonna be real. That? Like Big John, yes, I knew he was. Huh? Yes, go with social media. Say, what was social media done for TJ Slaughter back then? Did it got you in trouble? <laughs> you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like. I, I don't. I, I don't like. Let, let, this is what I'm gonna tell you. If I had social media back when I played, I've been done. I don't like social media. I like social media so my family knows I'm okay and all of this, but what goes on with social media, if it would have been back in my day, I don't think none of us would have made it. <laughs> <laughs> none of us. Oh, my God. The guys I know and the guys I had hung around and the way people are these days, we would be, we all would have been in trouble. All of us. <laughs> so so what do you think about – now, Now let's talk about the Jaguars for a minute. So – so I I have a beef because I said that this year they're doing so bad and there's only one coach that everybody don't mind playing for, and that's Keenan McCardell. So I made a comment last week. They need to fire all they ass, give the reign to Keenan, let him figure out to finish out the year, and that way it'll help his career and at the same time maybe help the Jaguars figure out some shit. And, and because if you look at Keenan McCardell on the sideline, you look at every coach in the Jaguars on the sideline during a game. You see players arguing with coaches, arguing with the defensive coach, arguing with – you ain't never seen no wide receiver arguing with Keenan McCardell since two years ago because Keenan will grab you. <laughs> I just, a level I, of respect. You, 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 <laughs> go ahead, John. I just – yeah, I feel you, man. It's like a level of respect, and he played the game. And when he played the game, he played the game. You understand what I'm saying? And – that's how, I mean, you go get their respect when you walk, when they walk in the door. That's Keenan McCarty. You know what he got. I want what he got. So if you, and I think all their wide receivers are great when every time they, because they get knowledge. It's, knowledge is that power, man. And then you take your talent and you go with it, man. I just, yeah. Go ahead, TJ. Well, there's, it's a level of respect, yes. But athletes today have to realize it's constructive criticism in everything you do. Yeah. Yeah. And if I want the best for you and I'm your coach, I might have to get in your butt. You got to understand that. I'm going to get in your butt sometime if you ain't doing right. So 
to see players arguing with coaches, there's a level of disrespect there. And somebody either that player got to go or that coach got to go because somebody ain't respecting each other. And that's the way you look at it. And you have to make an example sometimes out of people. And you got to say, look, I ain't going to have this. If I don't say fire the whole coaching staff, I, if you're going to do that, I say bring Kenny and make him the head coach and say who he want to keep on the staff. Because to fire a whole coaching staff in the league, we in and try to rebuild it in the middle of the season, it ain't going to happen. Yeah, so you got to always keep some. But Kenny so it was all about. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. So I just feel I. I feel I, I know Keenan. I know Keenan quite well. We didn't talk plenty of times. Even Keenan and Jimmy Smith, I I used to hang out with them and they weren't even linebackers, you know what I'm saying? It's like a couple of offensive players that I always hang with. I always got mad respect for, you know. And Keenan and Jimmy was some guys that I had respect for, you know. So actually he the one that I told my grown off the bone and rushing my abdomen when I played for the Saints. Keenan was the guy I called to find a doctor to help me get me healed. Cause I know Kenny used to have a partially torn hamstring and it, I, I mean hamstring and stuff and he'll play the next week. And I'm like, dude, how you heal yourself? And they knew somebody that did a little bit of everything. So he <laughs> is a beast and in more ways than one. Cause to put your body to the things he had to put his body through to play that game <coughs> and get back to play week in and week out when he had these certain injuries that I know should have kept him out at least a week or two. And he played. You putting yourself through some tough stuff, and I didn't do the same thing to put my body through it to get to stay on that field. So I have mad respect for Keenan, and if a young guy stepped to Keenan and he even got smarter, I think other players would step up. Saying that's the thing when when we was on a team, if somebody got wrong, the coach shouldn't have to defend it by itself. It should be other players like, "Hey man, don't talk to him like that." You know what I'm saying? You got to have right. other players step up too. So you got to have a level of respect. And a team is all built on a structure. You got to have your captain, your leader, and that's your leader. Then these are, you might have one get wrong, but you're going to have 30 get up in his face. Now tries. And then that's the way you build a, a team. You got to find your your dogs. Like I said, you got to find your wolves out the pack. Yeah. That's what we don't have. We team. don't have no alphas on our team. <laughs> that's the problem. That's the problem right there. Yeah, you got a whole bunch of people that's trying to be the leader and they all taking their own path. You got to have somebody that got the same mindset as the coach. I got to tell yeah. a coach, you got to always find you a dog. Yeah. And that, that dog got to be the wolf to lead the pack. And you got to find one on offense, one on defense, and one on special teams, at least them three. And then them got to have the same mindset as a head coach. They got to follow you and they ain't no page. If they ain't on your page, you got to get them on your page. And then they, it trickles down. And then you get your lieutenants and soldiers. You're going to have followers because everybody ain't built the same. I'm just, I'm sorry. You can say it's the elite level and everything else. Everybody ain't built the same. And when you get them dogs and they'll lead the pack and everything will be cool. But if somebody get out of line, it ain't for the coach all the time to get up in the player's face. Right. It's for the players to get up in the player's face and make them accountable for what they do. That's right. That's hey, right. Hey, man, now, look up. Look here, TJ, man. I really appreciate it. Cause, hey, I hope I hope people really got this. They got to look at this because you had some stuff for them. And it's so important. You you said it better than I ever said. I like that. I appreciate it. That's what I've been wanting to get out. I couldn't get it out right. I, I appreciate you having me, brother. I appreciate you having me. <laughs> yeah, man, but, uh, yeah, man, but uh, John, you got any last remarks or anything like that? Um man. It was, it was great. I mean, definitely got to have you come on game line, TJ. It's you two o'clock. Man, that's powerful, man. Just learning, like, for like an average person like myself to see what you guys put your body through later on. I mean, that's crazy. Most people don't realize how much pain you guys are going to have to retire. You know, you just think millions of dollars, and that's it. <laughs> hey, TJ, yeah, you that's got all any, I think about. You got any? Say that again. Got any? Do you got any? Uh, you know, business you want people to look at the slaughter show, the whatever. No, nah, man, I, I, I'm like, I, this is this is what I learned. I like the, the less you talk about, the better it be. So I'm trying to change the world, Amen. and I'm trying to do it in in minute stages. Right. So everything you see me do on Instagram and all like this, I'm trying to do something really big to change society. I don't like to talk about it now like this because there's a lot of evil people out there that don't want to see people succeed or don't want to see um, people come together and love one another. Yeah. And that the number one thing I learned through playing ball and all of this, all y'all were my brothers, man. Like, I, 
I miss the camaraderie. I miss your big butt in the club doing dances like you weigh a hundred eighty pounds. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna tell it, John. <laughs> so you know, but there's there's so many things that we can do as players, and I'm I, and somebody need to bring us together. First of all, we need to be taught how to manage our yeah. money, and it need to be a taught. It's not giving it to a financial advisor and saying how much percent you want a month because if they telling you telling them ten percent. And you want 10% or you want $10,000 a month, they making 80% on your money. And they ain't telling you that. So I, I and, and somebody need to be telling players that don't give your parents money. Don't give nobody straight money. Buy them an annuity. Put it in an annuity and let them um, earn a certain percentage a month. Because that, that money that's in the annuity, the principal stays with it and it gains. And they, they can spend monthly off of annuity. And you can have one sitting in your mama name, your uncle name, but nobody never told us this. I've been hanging around billionaires and all this. They all got annuities and stuff for their kids. And what? I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, I get, he gets $5,000 a month. And I put like $400,000 in his annuity and he get this much a month. I'm like, huh? <laughs> nobody never told us that. Because you should never spend your principal. Every dollar you made, you should put away. And that's what I said. So we need to teach this. And then all of us got a story. Like all of us come from different homes, different backgrounds. I thought my story was bad. Then I met Mike Adams and he had a whole different story. So it's just people have different stories. But you can you imagine the impact we can have if they set something up that we bring players, give them money in the pocket. They make something. They come here and they, in different arenas where they live at, that they talk to kids and they tell them their story and they inspire them and set it up. I, I don't understand. You got all these nonprofits and all this stuff. And you got all these athletes who have been through hell and high water and and people look up to, even if they didn't been through, in trouble, that we need to help. I mean, I tell people all the time, you, they say they're Christian and all that. Like this. I said, God, Jesus didn't go to just the the, the holiest man. He went to the, the, the prostitute, the, the, the adulterer, and all that. He went to the bad people. So to understand this, we can all help each other. And that's my main goal. I want to help. My fellow athlete, and I want to help everybody because I went I went to a school and I talked to these kids in high school, and uh, I talked all about football. I ain't gonna lie, I talked about football and my <laughs> life and all this. And this girl raised her hand. She like, I don't even know why I'm here. You didn't talk about nothing for girls, and I was like, dang, I did, and I limit myself. And that's when I realized I said, you know what, I gotta branch out to everybody. That's why I really ain't really did too much stuff with sports because I wanted to open my eyes. Because I've been in sports all my life. All my life. That's all I knew. So now I can bring the real world to the sports world and bring the sports world to the real world. And I can integrate it so good. And it goes together just like this. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and if you don't know it, I tell the guys half time, I, I tell all uh, ex-players, I said, dude, if you put half the effort in life as you did is playing that sport, you will succeed. Cause you, we don't realize what we have done to play this sport. All the working out, all the running, all the studying we did. All and the pills. Here, I understand we beat up, huh? All the pills. Yeah, but I, I understand we beat up now. Now brains are tired, but now you find stuff that you're good at. You find things that you can remember easily. You find things that you can talk about and not go crazy about. You know. And there's certain things people talk about, I get mad. Like when I talk about family and my home situation, I change. You know, like I can like I can go down the slumps. I can shut down. But you find things that people can talk about what they're good at. Hey, leader, we got so many guys that's training people and all this, but there's so much stuff that we can do to help each other that I'm surprised ain't nobody done before. So I'm working on something to try to bridge the gap between ex-players and current players. Yeah, and then bring these guys some money because the thing is, when you're done playing, nobody taught all the stuff I learned today. If I would have knew when I started, I'd be set for life. And ain't a lot of us not set for life right now, and a lot of us still working on stuff. But there's ways now to set things up to help people, even if they ain't got a dime to their name, to help them now get some money in their pocket and make sure they have benefits. Like I didn't even know about the HRA plan, the health reimbursement account, yeah. and to like till the guys got arrested for doing the thing with the uh, right. hyperbaric chambers. Yeah. I didn't even know we had that. 
<laughs> and nobody ain't telling me that, but a lot of guys ain't got money to put out their pocket to even get that referral. So what if we set up something and I'm gonna put it out there. I don't care if somebody take it, steal it. You know, it's helping, helping athletes. So whatever. What if you put something out there that you help somebody and you pay their hospital bill and if they got a health reimbursement account and you take 5% extra money, it's just like a loan. Is the league gonna pay it back to you? It's guaranteed. But why ain't nobody doing that for athletes? It's like they didn't use us and abused us and leave us here haywire and not knowing what to do. But then there's so many simple steps. Like the league should have something that's set up that say, you know what? You got a health reimbursement account that got $200,000 in it. You need your medical bills paid. Okay, we'll send you to the doctor. We'll get you this made. If you need stem cells, if you need some good stuff, not all this crap where they putting you on pills or cutting on you and all this crap, something to help a brother out that your insurance won't cover. And you sit up there, they pay for it, and they take 5% extra back. It's your money. It's just sitting there. And he's health reimbursement account. So why are they doing that for us? I don't understand. And then, like I said, I, I love the game, but there's so much more stuff could be done for players. And I and I and I hate the fact that we sit up here and we gotta have these talks and we look and it's like we played this game, we beat ourselves to death, we did everything you asked of us, and now you sit up here and look at us and don't don't even call and say, Hey, how are you doing health wise? How you doing? Right. That's that's the how you do. That's all. I, and this show me some options to help me, but yeah. it's not there. I say the same thing, TJ. And uh, I think that that with JFL, we're trying to bridge that gap. And we talk to a lot of different players, and we get everybody's perspective. We're gonna try to get everybody together so we can talk some more and and share a lot of stuff because we find out that I mean, since we've been doing the show, we find out that there's so many people and there's so many different things, athletes. They just don't know. And so now we're trying to bridge that gap and make sure everybody know who, who's who. And, and then bridge that gap with the Jaguars. Because they, you see, there's a, yeah, I, I, my the problem game. with the Jaguars and, and the NFL is they don't call they don't call T.J. Slaughter or John Henderson and say, hey, how you doing? But if there's a big event coming up, they say, John, you think you can come up here at 1230 yep. and, and sign some autographs? And, and we got a new mm-hmm. shirt for you to wear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's true. <laughs> I'm, just, that's so I'm being true. real about it because people don't know. People think that people think when you guys are out that the NFL talk to y'all every day. And I'm here to tell you, NFL don't talk to no player until Fourth of July, Veterans Day, Christmas, yeah, uh, uh, 50th anniversary. Then they call you the love that stuff. Other than that, yes, sir. You know. The owner ain't calling T.J. Slaughter and say, hey, man, just call a check on you. See how things go. Why don't you come to a game? You know, I, I ain't going to knock Shad Khan because he has been – I have talked to him a couple of times, and I've been in to reach out to him. So – and because I didn't present him some business things and stuff like that. So I can't knock him. He's a he's a different type of owner. He, yeah. I really? some owners. He, yeah, he, he, he's, he's a different type. He opened it up. Yeah, he's a – yeah. yeah, he's a, well, that's, he's that's a different owner. Here. So – yeah, I got to get him his props. And I ain't never played for him because Wayne Weaver was there when I was there. But I like I like Khan. I do like Khan. i like to see Tony Khan get more involved. Um, and, and before we end the show, I, I, I say this all the time. I truly believe that part of the Jaguars, Jaguars full of rookies. Jaguars problem is they don't have any veterans on the team and they don't have guys like you to go in the locker room and say, guys, we can win. Let me give y'all some. Let me give y'all some of what I got. They don't have none of that. They just go in the locker room and look at each other and say, "Yeah, this your first year. Yeah, this is my second year. All right, let's go play." <laughs> oh, they need guys to come in there and say, "You know what? Thursday night we coming in and we gonna watch film. We are gonna watch it as a whole defense. Yeah. After practice, we gonna run, but we gonna run all together. Everybody running DB times." Yeah. This is things. This is things you need. You need somebody to step up and just be a leader. You know what? Yeah. We gonna go through this. If we have a bad game, you know what? Everybody come in Monday morning. We gonna run and we gonna watch film. We gonna call each other out. We gonna look at each other. We gonna call. What the hell are you doing on this? What you doing on this? Yeah. You know. And that's the thing. We we talked to each other back in the day, and we asked each other what the hell was going on. And that's the thing. You we called each other. We held each other accountable. And if we had to get in each other's face and fight, yeah, you know, we'd get in each other's face and fight. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. That's the way it is. The, the players these days are a little sensitive. John, it's on you, baby. 
Well, I'm on my way down there because we finna get up out of here because real talk, I got to go to the bathroom so bad. <laughs> and, uh, I just wanted to, hey, look, I'm 40 and I can't hold it the way I used to hold it. I understand, hey, man. my brother. I understand. Hey, man, I love you, TJ, man. Jackson, love you, bro. Man, man, we are out of here. Let's peace. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Good to see you, peace. TJ. Good to see you.